there, my name is Duration and I'm here as the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Finding Our Future show. And we're here every other Tuesday, 1 to 1.30 p.m. Hawaii time. And um, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, so it's kind of unprecedented times to be alive. And things are changing so quickly, which is why I'm really excited that my guest today is Hunter Hevelin. And uh, he's a food systems planner here in Hawaii. So thank you, Hunter, for joining us. Thanks. Happy to be here. I'm back on Think Tech. Yes, good to see you, although not in person. Um, yeah. You, if you can just introduce yourself, um, I know you wear many hats. So, like, what is your role in food systems in Hawaii? Sure. Uh, I think most of my work broadly fits under food systems planning. Uh, a lot of times, I do a number, of, as you said, a few different things. I'm pursuing a PhD at UH Manoa in the Department of Geography and Environment, where my research is on agricultural change. Uh, here on the islands and looking some at what kind of periods of transition we've had and how that can inform facilitating a transition towards more sustainable food systems um, here in particular. And then a little bit of that has been very timely, at least looking at the history of emergency food planning. Um, my other hat, I chair the Sierra Club for the island of Oahu and uh, focus there on a lot of kind of watchdogging of agricultural development programs, land use, and so forth, uh, and advocating for good policy to support local food systems. And um, we have seen like tons of things change when it comes to food um, here in Hawaii with the global pandemic. I think historically we've, we've used the figures like, oh, 85% or 90% of food is imported here in Hawaii. And um, we've really seen kind of how severe that problem is with people panic shopping. Um, and we've been seeing the empty shelves on um, at grocery stores and really seeing um, how much of that packaged food can be at risk, especially when people panic shop the way that they do. So can you talk a little bit about what's happening with the food system and why Hawaii is so vulnerable to these issues? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we've necessarily seen a lot of times when people think about food system disruptions, uh, the supply side is what's considered, right? It's the it's imagining that the shelves are empty, not because we've gone in there panic buying, but because things aren't arriving, right? So there's a pretty common phrase of uh, the boats stop coming, that type of narrative, right? That as a island state, um, pretty far from everything, uh, we've are, you know, have some founded fears in terms of concern of being at the far end of the global food system, how reliant we are upon these imported goods and how resilient we might be to disruptions that extend now, as we can see through this pandemic globally, pretty rapidly. Um, the current disruption, like the, the, the empty shelves that we see are not a byproduct of supply side, um, supply chain disruptions at this point, really. This is kind of the, the panic buying that happens when you see a shelf start to empty, you also wanna you know fill your, fill your cart with goods. Um, what we may end up seeing down the line, is, or what we're starting to see in some other countries at least, is some of the kind of the same approach happening at a national level, right? So countries starting to close off some of their exports. If that continues to happen, or if fundamental disruptions say as borders get shut down, disrupt say the flow of labor, that's very important particularly in U.S. productivity, uh, we could start to see supply side, side disruptions um, more akin to the ones mm -hmm. we've, we've thought about historically. But you know, the food system here in particular, what we've seen to date is demand side, right? So where we used to go to get our food has been completely upended. And obviously we're not gonna be in a pandemic forever. I mean, this is a temporary situation, but it's definitely giving a lens into ways that our, our local food system is flawed and ways that we can improve it. So for me, I, I see it as like a really great opportunity and challenge to tackle together. Um, one thing that's been really fascinating and not something that I would have personally expected to happen so quickly is the surge in demand for local locally grown produce, especially those CSA boxes, which previously, for those who don't know, community supported agriculture are these like farm boxes or bags of produce that you get from a farm. You pick it up in a convenient location or you get it delivered to your door. And it's been a pretty like, only like the hippies 
get that you know and it was most people just went to the grocery store but um i mean i've heard from a lot of these local farmers and csa providers that their demand has surged to the point where they're sending out emails apologizing for being be behind and being like way overwhelmed with the demand and all the online orders that have just come through in the last week or two so can you just talk a little bit about what's happening there yeah i think part of it is is the the crowd nature of, of a, a supermarket uh, has a lot of people, I think, reasonably concerned, and as well as in their attempts to follow CDC guidelines about gathering and state regulations around stay at home and you know keep your distance, social distancing practices. That we're we're moving out of the uh, aggregate marketplace and trying to find alternatives that allow for home delivery, that allow for you know one on one type of pickup situations. The Farm Bureau, for example, is you know kicked off a a food hub of their own that's going to be a drive-through system tomorrow at Blaisdell. Um, and as you mentioned, a number of these CSA programs, that have, a number of the food hubs that have been in operation for a long time are seeing surges in, particip in participation, not just by consumers, but also by producers. And it's putting a strain on their ability to deliver, um, you know, uh, when you've got suddenly five, ten times as many people signing up as you would normally, you have to do a lot to try and uh, meet that demand and meet that that shifting sort of approach. The, the question that I think is important for us to start considering is how do we facilitate this shift in demand towards local goods? Or how, how do we make sure that that stands as we come out of this pandemic at some point in a kind of yet identified future time period? Um, I think it's quite reasonable that a lot of people that you know now are surging to get their local fare as soon as there's a, you know, a, a person comes down with a, with coronavirus on a particular farm, that that probably will shift how people start to think of these things, unfortunately. Um, but we need to think through how do we transition from this immediate surge in interest to shifting our food systems in the long term to continue supporting agriculture, which has long been one of the primary industries that we think of when we think about diversifying away from a tourism based economy. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a huge conversation to have there around Hawaii being so dependent upon tourism and Waikiki recently coming to its knees and having hotels completely dark. People aren't coming here anymore. Um, hotels are, I think I heard ho 100 hotels across Hawaii have closed down, mostly all of them being in Waikiki. So it's it's a really weird time and in a way for us to like reflect and reshape the economy. So I guess I'm wondering, from your perspective, having studied food systems for so long, what do you see um, as the best way to uh, use this opportunity for a positive long term shift in terms of our um, ability to have food sustainability and resiliency? So one of the, the primary efforts I'm working on at the moment is building sort of a coalition to essentially pitch to the powers that be to support the development of a food system resilience plan um, that I think would also be backed by essentially a task force or a pol food policy council type entity composed of industry um, practitioners, experts and so forth to identify what some of these long-term resilience goals are. And then within those goals, be thinking about what food emergency response planning should entail to get us closer to those goals. So that when we respond to this crisis, to when this crisis conceivably pops back up come f next fall or the, f the fall thereafter, for example, um, that, that we're getting ourselves closer to where we want to be in the long term, as opposed to now where we're seeing a lot of scrambling, a lot of amazing work happening across the food system from chef hui's to food banks to all manner of organizations working to maneuver food to those who need it. And particularly our existing emergency food planning focuses a lot on those who are hungry, those who are unable to currently provide for themselves. The system, as I have thought about it, food systems in general, um, really, the emphasis is often on supply side disruptions, right? But this demand side disruption, as I was saying earlier, is in where we get our food right now. But if we think about what this pandemic could do, what this shutdown could do to our, our economy and our ability to purchase food, our entitlements, essentially, our, our ability to, our income, 
right? Three months down the line, how many of us are going to be able to make a decision between a grocery store or a CSA versus do we pay our rent? Do we continue to pay our health insurance? And so the, the timeline of this pandemic is really calling into question a lot of these, you know, deeper, broader um, issues. For example, what happens in three months when unemployment conceivably hits 25%, 30% and nobody can buy food anymore? Our food banks are not designed um, to handle that type of response. So we need longer term planning, um, both about where we want to go and expanded current emergency planning to think about how we can get there. Do you have examples of cities or states that have done this and um, have had success or maybe other countries um, that you would model off of? And and another question on top of that would be like, what would that plan hypothetically or potentially include that would help create solutions to the problem? So I, I despite studying this for many, many years, would not feign to be the sage to say exactly what that should, should entail. Um, in terms of looking elsewhere, I mean, we do face a novel situation. There are many other island states that are able to govern food in a very different way because they are often nation states in themselves. We are in the very unique context of being essentially a, you know, a distant state within a broader nation state. And so we, through the Commerce Clause and so forth, have relationships with other states that we can't just upend or, or um, okay. cease our imports, for example, right? Or, or moderate our imports or even tax them differently. So it really modifies how we can approach trying to build these more resilient systems. In terms of what types of things this could, uh, such a plan could, could maybe begin to address is I think thinking about what entitlement programs are. What, how do, how do uh, living wage uh, goals fit into the ability of people to feed themselves in the long term and that it directly impacts what food prices are and that impacts the ability of farmers and essentially farms to be viable here. Um, so it's a thing interconnected across these various systems. Um, another example, I was talking with some folks at CTAR this week, you know, there's this, this surge in food hubs, but in my experience, um, I was the manager at FarmLink here on Oahu for a few years that we had a lot of new farmers in particular coming into the program that didn't necessarily have the experience with grading, with uh, packing and those types of tools. Historically, College of Tropical Agriculture has done a lot of work in cooperative development. And cooperatives form uh, a very important intermediary um, aggregator and scale connector between small farms. You know, our average farm size is under 10 acres. I think vast majority of them are around five acres. Um, but a five acre farm worked pretty well when you were selling to a wet market or a corner store, or maybe even a supermarket, but now we've got Costco and Whole Foods and so forth. And so your five acres of production doesn't fit into their global supply chain network. We need intermediary tools to connect the scales between these things. And we need to have additional providers of you know, skills training, like say College of Tropical Agriculture to work with these producers so that the food hubs can do their job doing the aggregating and connecting. Can you just list some of the major players? I mean, you, you kind of mentioned some like FarmLink, there's food hubs, like what are the food hubs? What are the co-ops um, that currently exist that people can look to and look into to start, you know, getting, getting to know what, what's going on here locally? Sure. There, so I did a, a study last fall for Hawaii Green Growth on assessing local food price. We haven't had a agricultural statistical service functioning here for about a decade. So we had very little knowledge about what local food prices were, particularly for small farmers, because that varies. Uh, that's pretty different than if you're a large wholesale producer, right? So I did a study of looking, working to try and collect data from as many of the food hubs were across the state that were able or willing to participate and uh, ended up putting together a map as well that's up on my website of the food hubs across uh, the island. So we've got, you know, essentially from a few a few different ones on Oahu, there's one on Molokai, there's like uh, Maui, I believe another is, at least maybe two others might be in the works on Maui. Um, a couple good sites on the big island, one of which, you know, adaptations have been running for 30 years or so. Um, and I believe some others that are now possibly going to pop up on the Big Island. So there's pretty good spatial coverage with one, one major gap in particular that Kauai um, did not actually have a, an entity um, performing this role 
quite the same way as these others were. Malama Kauai has been doing amazing work, amazing spectrum of work um, in the food system for a long, long time. And it has, particularly in this crisis, um, really, really done heroic volumes of, uh, of connecting um, people and food on that island. Um, but that's different than a longer term, you know, per you know, an entity that's focused on being playing this intermediary role between, say, producers and markets or producers and consumers. Um, so there's For a, a pretty wide. Are kind of, yeah. I'm just wanted to if you can introduce like what a food hub is for those who are pretty new to the concept in this this field. Sure. So food hubs. Uh, I, I wish I could rattle off the USDA definition for you from memory, but I can't. Uh, the essentially they are they are aggregators and distributors often of produce, and they they can take a lot of different forms, right? So sometimes it might be. Uh, a hui of farmers get together and they're going to aggregate and then distribute. It could be a, a nonprofit, for example, on Molokai, uh, Sustainable Molokai runs this mobile market program where they've got producers um, on island whose goods they then distribute through various means to, to buyers on the island. So a lot of individuals in particular. Um, others function differently. So adaptations uh, on the big island has been running, you know, they were essentially a farm and then grew out from there uh, and have had a lot of restaurant clients, right? We're, we're kind of instrumental in Hawaiian, Hawaiian regional cuisine being developed as part of that sort of early farm to table um, moment, movement here. Uh, more recently, Oahu Fresh uh, on Oahu, Kahumana Food Hub, uh, you know, is their, their farm at Kahumana has also expanded to play this kind of community role. That's under a nonprofit arm. Um, arm. Oahu Fresh and FarmLink are both um, businesses that, that run this uh, similar operation. So they can take a lot of different forms. But the primary bit is number of producers, you aggregate their goods and you, you, you know, take care of some of the distribution and sales. And it allows farmers to focus on farming instead of having to do, you know, the whole swath of all the market, market development and so forth. And, um, in my experience, I think the farmers farmers liked it. Yeah, I'm sure they're grateful that they can focus on farming, which is their primary goal, and not have to worry about all the other business um, aspects and the um, distribution chain. So that's great. Um, and then you had shared some maps. So there's a Hawaii-wide map and an Oahu map. If we can show those really quick. And can you just explain a little bit about what your goal here was with making these? Yeah, so this was a this is just like one bit of a, a that broader project for Hawaii Green Growth as a contribution to the state's uh, food dashboard, and so this is just a, a map of points uh, uh, with contact information that you can click around if you're on on whichever island and see okay here's how I can you know access a whole bunch of farmers through one place, um, and this was something that I just sort of threw together after after this pandemic kicked off and this is essentially farm link oahu, farm link in in red uh oahu fresh in blue and kahumana in green for their distribution areas and their distribution days with links to their website pretty fa really fast and dirty mapping i think two of the three of those i did just called my friends that run those organizations and said okay tell me tell me where it is and i plotted out a little map and then threw that out there um <laughs> But what that also highlights, right, is that there are gaps in coverage, even here on Oahu, right? So if you're above, say, hygienic store towards Laie, and you're a farmer that wants to get your goods to market, you're going to probably have to move a pretty good ways to get it somewhere mm -hmm. where one of these aggregators is able to pick it up easily. Um, and similarly, if you're you know, a consumer in one of those regions, you're going to have to travel a good ways to, to get access to these goods. Yeah, so there's opportunity here for sure. Can you um, share where people can find those maps and the, these data points if, in case they want to look at them in the future? Sure. My website is supersistence.org. Uh, it's like subsistence, but better. Um, so S-U-P-E-R-S-I-S-T-E-N-C-E.org. And that's got a whole bunch of different different websites and tools I've been throwing together. Um, as well, well yeah, as you can I think see your data your love for data is a huge benefit to the movement. So thank you for putting that stuff together. Mapping's not everyone's skill set or interest. It's definitely, uh, yeah, uh, as a geographer, um, it, it is me hewing close to home, but um, it's, a, it's at least a, a way for people to, to see something and see data in a way that makes it a little easier to, to, to think about and to think through. 
And I want to talk about what's going on with restaurants right now. I know a lot of local produce, and maybe you have some percentages here. That would be cool if you did, um, of like what percentage of local food was locally grown food was going to restaurants versus individuals and how that shifted just in the past few weeks with the stay at home order and the shutdown with the pandemic. Um, if you have those numbers, if you just want to like touch upon that, because I know delivering to homes and it's much more um, burdensome for the farmers and the food distributors because there's so many more people to, to deliver to families and individuals as opposed to giving bigger quantities to restaurants that are largely now closed or their operations have been severely reduced. So I don't know if you can speak to that um, topic a little bit. Sure, I, I definitely don't have numbers about uh, how much local food has moved around. I think the closest we'd be able to get to something like that would be looking at the, uh, it, it would take sort of the backend data from aggregators and distributors like food hubs or some of the more broadline um, distributors to, to, to see how that transition has changed. Um, what, what I can tell you is that one of the things that a lot of farms have been dealing with is that they're, you know, a, a primary sales outlet for, for farms that have been working at scale for a long time is often hotels, restaurants, um, larger food service um, systems, where now they're scrambling to say, okay, how do I, do I let this rot in the field? Do I harvest it and try and find another market? It, does it pencil out to do deliveries? If, you know, you're working mostly with individual buyers, which are, you know, if you've got a, a whole field of, of goods and you're trying to sell it by the pound um, and you're going to have to deliver that, it, it starts to not make economic sense pretty quickly. And so the, the shuffle that's happened and some of the other work that's been going on is trying to see, particularly with, with I know Claire Motlo has been working on this, is trying to see what type of um, financial resources can be distributed to farmers to essentially pay for those goods. And then those the goods end up then at farm or at food banks rather, that are now you know part of the frontline response um, for folks whose you know ability to pay their own rent or buy their own food has been disrupted. Right. Um, what one thing I was curious about is what you see. I mean, this is like a situation that's like quite unprecedented. So things are like every single day. Um, but what do you see as the long term ideal? vision for our food system where we do have like a diver diversified economy outside of tourism where things aren't so hotel driven and tour tourism driven um when it comes to food local communities like wh what do you see um for your ideal vision um i don't have a, a a perfect crystal ball i will say um by far but one of the ways i've been trying to think about and frame some of this thinking is thinking of what does an archipelago economy look like, right? We will continue to be part of the world, um, imagining that we're going to become wholly self-sufficient. I, I don't think is actually a more resilient thing than having a relationship with the broader world that's a little bit more on, on our terms, or, or at least based on decisions that we've made as opposed to um, conditions that we've inherited. And so I think that the, the food system resilience planning process will do a lot to help identify, uh, you know, what it is that we are seeking out of our food systems and who it is that we're, we're aiming to benefit through them, right? So there's been a, some popularization, or rather not popularization, there have been num a couple of efforts, right? So we had the statewide Aloha Plus Challenge to double our local food production. We have the Governor's Sustainable Hawaii Initiative also to double local food production by 2030 and 2020, respectively. They didn't necessarily lay out much in the way of plans about how to get there. Um, and so what we've seen in particular of late is a lot of large finance capital investment moving into the local food space that is conceivably going to be displacing not so much the small backyard operators or hobby farmers, but the commercialized long time farm, family farms in, in some cases that have been here for many years, right? So when, for, for example, Villa Rose Eggs wants to come in, which is a partnership with the largest egg distributor and the largest egg producer on the mainland, wants to come in and you know get up to a million eggs a day my friends in Waimanalo with 25 chickens aren't going to go out of business, but the family farms that have been operating in Wahiwa for 80, 100 years 
they're the ones that are going to be imperiled, right? And so what we may end up seeing as a byproduct of this is, is that these firms come in while it makes economic sense. And if situations like now happen where the economic winds change and it becomes unprofitable to work here or more profitable to work somewhere else, that they were likely to leave. And we will have a hollowing out of the middle of our agricultural productivity and be left with a less professional class of, of farmers and a less ability to actually feed ourselves in the long run. So we need to be very conscientious about what the state supports and how it chooses to support agriculture here. And in my opinion, there is a is is now and has for a long time been significant underfunding in supporting um, productivity and particularly family farmers, right? If we need to take a livelihoods perspective, not just a calorie perspective. It's not just how much we produce, but it's who produces it and how they benefit from that economy and how their work and participation in our environment and in our communities supports our broader goals as an island, as an island state. Yeah, I think the government has a big role. They have set pretty ambitious goals and they need to um, probably step up in terms of their implementation of that. So that's a really good call to action for the state. What would be, we're coming on our last minute here, so what would be your call to action um, for people, people who are staying at home right now, people who are just like wanting to be a part of the solution? Um, I know that there's been a lot of interest in, or, or some growing interest uh, in like victory gardens and that kind of work. Um, I think I, I, I would advocate for people to go out. You've got some time, go try out a green thumb. Um, not because I believe that radical self-sufficiency is the, the path to um, our island's sustainability or resilience, but because I think you'll probably realize quickly how difficult this work is, how challenging it is, and how complex it can be and that might give you a little bit more willingness to pay when you next time you're at the market or when you're making your decisions about what type of agriculture and what type of food system you want to support um and mm -hmm. so if if laboring in your yard is brings you joy great um but we should not mistake lifestyle decisions for you know community resilience necessarily and so go out totally. there and give it a shot uh, and then find find the farmer in your neighborhood and maybe don't haggle with them so much next time if you can. <laughs> Support your farmers, try farming so you know how hard it is. Um, so supersistence.org. Thank you, Hunter, for being um, an awesome advocate and uh, food assistant. So thank you so much and hope you're having you some fun time at home. <laughs> Likewise. Bye. Uh,